everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. You have a great turnout. My name is Daniel Bragan. I'm an economics and math major here at Susquehanna University. Uh, tonight, we'll be having a lively, thought-provoking debate and discussion between uh, Dr. Mark Rank, the author of Poorly Understood, and Mr. Ed Connor, the author of the, um, I'm sorry, I forgot the title, <laughs> Upside of Inequality. Uh, during the semester in the class, uh, Poverty, Inequality, and Economics, we have op the opportunity to read both these uh, these books have discussions with the authors via Zoom, ask them probing questions about the books, and as well as their thoughts on a wide range of public policy issues uh, and uh, things of that nature. Uh, so we're really excited to have them tonight and have these previous discussions. So thank both the authors for being here tonight and in person to have this discussion. Uh, Dean Rizzo, uh will be moderating the debate tonight. Dean Rizzo is the Dean of the Sigma Weiss School of Business here. He's also a professor of economics. Uh, he teaches a class game theory. If anyone's ever taken that class, great class, I recommend. Uh, he is uh, the, the dean of the business school. His research interests range from economic, uh, economic resources for education, uh, experimental auctions, as well as uh, public policy issues. He also uh, created and maintains the websites Broadway Economics and the Economics of Star Wars, uh, which I help edit with him. Uh, he's been quoted and interviewed in hundreds of uh, news outlets like Fox News, BBC World News, News Today, and the Washington Post. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree in economics from the University of South Dakota and a PhD from Iowa State University. Uh, so now I'd like to pass the mic off to Dean Rizzo to introduce both the authors uh, and uh, have them on the stage right now. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, so I'm Matt Rizzo, Dean of the Sigmund Weiss School of Business, and it's a privilege to be here tonight. A uh, couple short words, Daniel alluded, there is a class that was surrounding this um, poverty, uh, poverty, inequality, and economic policy, where we have 10 different, where you have 10 students who read the books of both uh, Dr. Rank and Mr. Connard throughout the semester, and then had a chance to Zoom one on, into the class Zoomed separately with each author, which was, which was really uh, kind of very exciting, thought-provoking. That class is uh, co-taught by Provost Dave Ramsaran and Dr. Nick Clark uh, from Political Science and myself. Um, the, the goal of both this event and the class in general was one, to dive into these issues quite a bit more, for us to understand a little bit more about poverty, inequality, economic policy, but also to have civil discourse, to kind of understand that we could debate, we could disagree on these issues. And trust me, myself and the other two professors in there, we disagree as the students in the class will tell you, uh, and yet, we disagree. We are, you know, we discuss policy and uh, try to figure out what's motivating the other individual. Why, why do we think they might be wrong and what, what can we learn from them? And we're excited to kind of have that tonight as well, to both learn a little bit, but also to promote the idea that, look, we can disagree on really tough topics and still be civil and, and have a good conversation and, you know, go have a drink with the person quite well, if you're of age, of course. Uh, so, with that said, um, I'd like to invite Dr. Rank and Dr. Connor to the stage, and I'll do short bios of each of them. While they're coming to the stage, uh, there's going to be six questions tonight, and then each, uh, each author will have a chance to have a closing statement. The first question will be about, uh, the four minutes will be allowed for a response, and I'm gonna have this up, and I'm gonna try to set the timer and do my best to maintain time. So four minutes per response for the first question, two minutes for every other question, and then a closing statement that you know, could be in the three to four minute range. But after each question, I'll also allow a little bit of time for some back and forth uh, between our uh, esteemed guests. So this, uh, the questions, often at these events, we'll open it up to a Q&A afterwards. We kind of did it a, a little bit backwards. The questions here came from myself, from Dr. Ramsaran, and from Dr. Clark, but with a lot of input from the students. So the students in the class really came up with a lot of the questions you're about to hear today, and I'll be giving credit to them as I read the specific questions to them. So I say there's not really a Q&A part after, but I'm sure both of our authors might be happy to meet with you a little bit after if you have any questions, if you want to catch them right after the talk. So on to the bios. So Ed Connard is the author of two top 10 New York Times bestselling books, The Upside of Inequality, How Good Intentions Undermine the Middle Class, and Unintended Consequences, Why Everything You've Been Told About the Economy is Wrong. Uh, 
He's an adjunct fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Previously, he was a founding partner of Bain Capital, where he worked closely with his friend and colleague, former presidential candidate Mitt Romney. Conard has a Master of Business Administration degree from Harvard Business School and a Bachelor of Science degree in Engineering from the University of Michigan. And I hope you'll give a nice round of applause to Mr. Conard. Mark Rank is the Herbert S. Hadley Professor of Social Welfare at the University of Washington, St. Louis. Uh, Dr. Rank is the author of several books on poverty and his most recent book, Poorly Understood, was released in 2021 and examines a wide variety of aspects of poverty and argues that many widely held views on poverty are inaccurate. In particular, Rank and his colleagues discuss the myths around poverty and argue that most Americans will be impoverished at some point in their lives. Dr. Rank is the recipient of many awards and his research has been reported in a wide range of media outlets. He has provided his research expertise to members of the US Senate and House of Representatives. Dr. Rank earned his PhD in sociology along with master's and bachelor's degrees in sociology from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Let's give a round of applause to Dr. Rank. So there, there are no real opening statements to kind of set up this discussion. Uh, we are going to rotate through. So each question that I answer will have, if one author answers the first question first, then the next question will rotate to the, to the other side. I think as a, a quote from Dr. Rank earlier today, this isn't a presidential debate. So I don't know how crucial it is that we do this, but we want to have it. We want to try to make it as uh, fair as possible. Um, so the first question, we'll, we'll start with, uh, with Dr. Rank and you have four minutes to answer. And it's an adapted two-part question that came from two students in the class, uh, Anthony Marte and Chris Kerwin. Uh, what is the top thing we could do to help the poor and the working and middle class? And it's a two-part question because I'd like a discussion on what we could do that would help in the short term, say the next six months to two years, and also in the long run, say 25 to 50 years from now. So yeah. Dr. Rank, you All right, have well, that's a, an easy question. No. <laughs> um, it's great to be here uh, and have this uh, discussion that we're gonna have. I, you know, you don't see it that often where, uh, as, as Matt was saying, you know, we can have a civil discussion and talk about issues and, um, and disagree, but uh, go on and uh, have a drink afterwards, as you said. So, um, so you know, this is, this is uh, a great question to start off with. And um, in terms of thinking about the short term, for the next two or three years, what could we do that would be most effective in terms of uh, both helping the poor and kind of the working or middle class. And I, to me, uh, the most important thing, the best poverty um, uh, alleviation strategy is to have more jobs that pay a living wage and that provide decent benefits. Um, I don't know if you know, but over the last 50 years or so, the U.S. has done a pretty good job in terms of creating jobs, uh, much better than European countries. But more and more of those jobs that we've been creating tend to be low-paying jobs, part-time jobs, and jobs that don't have benefits like health care and other things as well. Um, so today it's estimated that about 40% uh, of all current jobs in the United States are, count are considered low-paying jobs. That is less than $16 or $17 an hour. Um, and a lot of poverty that you see and a lot of economic insecurity is tied to that. So I think the, the kind of in the short term, if we can get more jobs that pay a decent wage and that have some benefits attached to them, that would go a, a long way to helping both those in poverty and and the working class as well. Um, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about some strategies for uh, how to do that. In terms of the long term, the, the 25 or 50 year um, perspective, I think the most important thing that we could do is really to invest in children's uh, well being and potential. Um, so, this would include things like investing in uh, health care, in child care, and really making sure that every child in the United States gets a first rate education, um, which is not the case uh, today. 
So, you know, we like to emphasize that in the United States, there's a real importance of the idea of equality of opportunity. But um, in America, that clearly is not happening. And one of the reasons why it's not happening is because we have these wide differences in the quality of education that children are getting. Some are getting a really good education and others are not. So I think that every child has the right to basically reach their full potential. Um, and as I, I'll probably argue later on, that really benefits us all. When we invest in children and allow them to reach their potential, we create a more dynamic, more productive society and a society that probably will have much less poverty. So those, those would be my recommendations. Super. Thank you. Uh, same question to you, Ed. Um, oops, hold on. In the short run, can we large, largely can only reduce poverty by giving more money to the poor. We already transfer $2 trillion a year to the elderly. For perspective, an American retiree enjoys about 70% more income than a French retiree who has the most generous government uh, pension plan of all, of all countries. We also give about $1.3 trillion a year to the non-elderly, not counting the $4 trillion we spent during the pandemic. And so together, that's about 15% of GDP. Net of taxes, because uh, Europe charges a lot more taxes than the US, America transfers about 6% of GDP to the bottom 50%, a three times greater share of GDP than Western Europe. And that's four times, that's four times more dollars per capita because our per capita GDP is 33% larger. $1.3 trillion divided among the poorest 50 million non-elderly Americans equates to about $25,000 per person or $100,000 for a family of four. Far more than the $25,000 poverty threshold and the $65,000 median household income. Some of that money ends up in the pocket of the middle class, but we still give single mothers in need over $40,000 a year if they remain attached to the workforce. We give people who can't work a similar amount. So counting all the money we spend, most of which poverty statistics ignore, cuts poverty to about 15 million people. You often hear a number of 40 million, but most of that is before benefits. Many of those are illegal immigrants. Most of them are able-bodied adults without children who work less as we give them more. America has the lowest workforce participation of prime working age men of any high wage economy. About 80% among high school graduates, only 15% among native born high school dropouts, which compares to about 90% workforce participation of foreign born high school dropouts. Now, Mark's book claims that jobs are like musical chairs. There's not enough of them to go around. That's true during a recession when we distribute billions of dollars of additional unemployment benefits, but 45 million foreign-born adults and their 20 million native-born adult children have all found work in America. There's no shortage of low-skilled work. And advocates of low-skilled immigration even point to jobs that they claim Americans won't do. So to alleviate the poverty that remains, we can't just give people more money. To keep them attached to the workforce and leading productive lives, we must provide them with day-to-day -day supervision, diverting, which requires us to uh, divert supervision uh, to the poor has an enormous cost to, uh, to middle and working class Americans who depend on scarce supervision to earn more money. According to the OECD, America has twice as many academically low scoring adults per capita as Northern Europe and half as many high scoring adults. That gives Scandinavia four times more high scores per low score as the United States, four times as much supervision. It's an enormous difference. And despite substantially less supervision, America's middle class earns 20% more than Scandinavia, 30% more than Germany, 40% more than France, 50% more than the UK, 70% more than Italy with similar test books. For a comparable test score, the average American earns about 50% more than their Scandinavian counterpart. And Europe would be poor still if it wasn't free riding on America's innovation, its defense spending, and its healthcare profits. And if it weren't mortgaging its future by underinvesting and growing more slowly. The question is not whether we should help the poor, um, but whether doing even more, substantially more than Western Europe remains our highest priority. Government spending has grown from 32% of GDP in 2000 to 38%, subtracting out the costs of the pandemic, and it's projected to grow to nearly 50% as baby boomers retire. Help the poor, absolutely. Spend more on the poor, perhaps. 
Increase government spending as a share of GDP? No. Reallocate government spending based on our priorities. So the most impactful things we can do over the next 30 years would be to persuade more talented Americans to get the arduous training, perform the tedious tasks, and take the risks that create high paying jobs for other people. The more the middle class earns, the more they're willing to help the poor. Instead, we're teaching students the difficult, instead of teaching them the difficult tasks of creating value, we're teaching them the easy task of redistributing what other people have worked hard to create, and that doesn't bode well for America's future. We should also use immigration to recruit more talented people from the rest of the world, given the distribution of our demographics. And if we don't care about the rest of the world's poor and only care about our poor, we could raise low-skill wages by reducing low-skilled immigration. We should also ease real estate re restrictions, especially in our fast-growing cities, to lower the cost of housing. Mark, any, I, I, have, I have more questions, but I want to give you also a quick moment here. I think you took a little bit less time uh, to answer. Oh. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I mean, what I'm suggesting is, you know, that we have jobs that, um, that, uh, that are very low paying, that don't provide benefits. And I think, um, that's pretty clear, uh, and investing in children, I think. So I, I guess I, I don't necessarily see what we're saying as, as necessarily in opposition with one another. I mean, I think you would agree that, Investing in children's human potential is, is a smart policy to do. And, um, you know, paying people a decent wage for, for working, uh, I think, is also a smart policy. I, I would say I think uh, people have the impression that we can simply pay employees whatever we would like to pay them. And so we are choosing not to pay them as much as, as we ought to. First thing I'd say is this, is you quoted 40 percent for the number of low paying jobs. I think most people quote 30 percent. About 28% of our population scores level one or below on academic scores are the ones I was citing. So of course we have to create jobs for people that have very low academic scores. We have about the same number of low scoring, low paying jobs as low scoring uh, workers. And I think what people forget is employers don't hire employees. Customers hire employees. Employers hire employees on behalf of customers. So you every day decide whether you're gonna buy a video game which doesn't require any low-skilled labor, or a meal at McDonald's, which requires a fair amount of low-skilled labor. Standing behind that guy at McDonald's is an army of talented people who are thinking about how to make that hamburger taste better, how to advertise, how to get you in the store, how to get you through the line quickly, how to help that low-skilled worker show up for work, be able to add up your check with, a, with a, a machine with capital that helps them fry the burger the same every time. So it's easy to say, hey, we ought to have more low, uh, higher paying jobs for low-skilled workers. We have one quarter as many high-skilled workers per low-skilled worker as northern and, you know, Western Europe, Northwest Europe is probably the best way to describe the most prosperous companies. So who's going to do that? We have to persuade our students to dictate, to do the training, get the work, to create those jobs. And we ought to go out and recruit more high skilled uh, workers from the rest of the world to help us do it as well. But every person we put on that job, creating another job at McDonald's, which by the way, we, we complain about McDonald's. We complain about Walmart. These are the people who every day have their sleeves rolled up trying to create higher paying jobs for the lowest skilled workers. And we don't embrace them and say, you know what? What we ought to do is increase the earned income tax credit. We complain, oh, that helps Walmart. That helps McDonald's. Exactly. You need day-to-day -day supervision of the poor if you're going to help them. I ran warehouses for people that made $15 an hour. The turnover rates three months. We had to check people every day till 10 o'clock in the morning because they show up hungover and they can't, pick the they can't pick the work in a way that satisfies our customers. And so we can't keep our business if we don't have a lot of supervision and work to make those workers work. It's not as easy as just saying, you know what, let's start paying them $20 an hour. You won't buy the product at $20 an hour. I'll give you a final word on this one if you want before I go to question two. Uh... <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, and I think we'll talk about, um, you know, uh, what we think are some strategies that we might both agree on uh, in terms of this question of low paying jobs. And I think we probably both would agree on the earned income tax credit as being a good policy in terms of boosting the wages of folks who are working full time. So I think there are places where we could probably agree that that it would be well spent so so we'll get to that yeah okay.
the next question. We will, we, will go to, we will go to question two, and this one will start with Ed. So we're down to two minutes per response um, for the remaining five questions. Uh, so the second question is adapted from one that uh, Danny Bragan, who did a great job uh, kind of kicking us off tonight, did. And so in the 2020 presidential race, uh, Democratic candidate Andrew Yang proposed a universal basic income of $1,000 per month. Do you think a plan like this would be a good idea or not? And we'll start with that. Well, I think it's a bad idea. I think it's a horrible idea. Um, even Paul Krugman, a leading liberal economist, has spoken out against it. I'll count the ways in which I think it's bad. First, it would cost upwards of $3 trillion, as much as we're currently spending to help the poor and the elderly. That's another 15% of GDP on top of the 38%, growing to 48% of GDP government already consumes. If we just simply replace the existing aid program with UBI, then we're taking money away from people who need it and giving it to people who don't. We give a poor single mother with a dependent child who remains attached to the workforce, works part-time, uh, about $40,000 a year. Yang's plan would give her $12,000 a year. And I often wonder if proponents of UBI aren't staunch conservatives, their plan would take from the poor and give to the rich. The third problem with it is, is you know, consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. One size does not fit all. We have a multitude of programs because people have a multitude of needs. We don't need to give heating oil credits to people who live in the South, as much health care to people who aren't sick, or child care credits to people who don't have children. We need to tailor the help to their need. And Yang's plan doesn't do that. Fourth, we know that many people will work less if we give them more, and there's already a substantial problem with that. As I pointed out, lottery winners reduce their earned income about 50 cents for every dollar they win. And uh, all but the most talented people all but the most talented Americans have worked less as they earn more. The fifth problem is that many people need helpful supervision. And so giving them money and sending them on their way hurts them and it hurts their children. We need social workers to interact with, with the recipients. And aid often has to come with responsibilities to enter drug rehabilitation, for example, or to identify the father of your child. So I understand why people want to reduce the marginal tax rate on poor people who lose benefits as they work more, but we shouldn't take a shot of malaria to cure a cold. UBI is a cheap political gimmick that'll hurt poor people uh, more than it will help them. Okay, right, well, <laughs> so let me give you a little background on this. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of... Um, I'm kind of in the middle on whether this, this is a good idea or not, but the idea is actually one that goes way back. So Thomas Paine in 1776 suggested that we have a universal basic income. Richard Nixon in the early 1970s proposed this, it actually passed in one house of Congress, um, but didn't get through, I think it was the Senate. Um, and it's an idea that it, it's interesting that uh, it is one of these ideas that conservatives and liberals sometimes agree on this. Milton Friedman was a, was a big proponent of this idea again in the, in the 1970s. Um, I think the advantage is it's a very direct way of assisting low-income families. You know, you don't have all the, you wouldn't have all the bureaucracy and things like that. You're just transferring $12,000 in the Yang proposal. Um, it is a, the idea of a universal basic income would have more support because it's a universal benefit. Um, the research actually shows there's, there was this big study done in Stockton, California. There's been some studies done in, in other places as well. That's actually shown that it's had quite positive effects. And actually, uh, employment rates were higher in a couple of these studies uh, for folks that were getting the universal basic income than folks that weren't. Um, and, and we could talk about why that might be. Um, and basically what we saw with the child tax credit in the Biden administration from July to, um, to January of this year was a form of a universal basic income. It, it went to children, uh, folks that had kids in the household, but it was the idea of a universal basic income. A lot of people said that was a really valuable, um, a really important help that they were getting. I, m my sort of um, uh, uh, feelings on the other side is that I think a universal basic income is a very hard sell in the United States. I think it's a very hard um, idea to sell because many people are going to say, you know, we're giving people something for nothing uh, and we expect something in return. And, you know, that feeling is a very strong feeling that's out there. So I think it, it's, 
I think there are a number of advantages, but I think in reality, it's, it's a very hard sell for the United States. Um, actually, interestingly, Switzerland um, had, a, had a, um, a ballot issue to have a universal basic income a few years ago, and it, and it failed. Um, so I, I, think, I think that that idea in the United States, again, is going to be a really hard one to, to, uh, to actually uh, accomplish. But I, I do think there are certain advantages to it. Two thoughts I, I would say. The first is I would divide people between people who can't work. Uh, single mothers with children, young children, and have a difficult time remaining attached to the workforce. Disabled people can't work, people with mental health problems. Those people can benefit from universal basic income or just giving them money because they're not gonna be able to work no matter how much we might want them to work or like or hope that they can work. There's a second group of people who can work. And that problem is the more money you give that group, there are some people in that group who will work less as you give them more. I'd like to think, and Milton Friedman, this is before we had all the data, just believe that, you know, if it's money and sense people, and all you got to do is give people more money, and they'll work more. But we see from the data that isn't true. I'd also turn to the Stockton study, which if you read it, you won't be very persuaded by it. It's tiny. They get the, the benefits for about six months, so nobody's going to change your behavior for a couple of bucks over six months. Okay, the, the, the people, they, when you look at the people who are in the study, and by study, I mean like tens of people, it's just tiny, okay? The people who are in the study don't look like uh, the average person. They tended to be less employed before the study started and slightly more employed after the study started. This is like a six month, it's like a very short period of time. It skews, for example, towards uh, Asian immigrants who have outperformed even native born people on average. And so there's a lot of problems citing the Stockton study as evidence that universal basic income works. You will not be persuaded if you actually read the study. I would say that there's, there's other research out there as well. Um, the other body of research that's interesting is in the early, in the mid 1970s, we did a lot, these large experiments called the negative income tax experiments. And I don't wanna get into all the details about that, but some of the findings that came out of that studies really um, had an effect on killing the idea of uh, universal basic income. They were finding some work disincentive effects and some family um, sort of disillusion effects as well. So, um, so yeah, I, but I, I do think that you know there are there's other work that's been done recently besides the Stockton study that that shows that there actually are some very positive effects out there. Cool. We'll move on to question three. We'll start. This one with Mark. Um, do you think that today in the United States that the U.S. provides enough of a social safety net for the poor? Okay, so I know that Ed and I are going to vehemently disagree on this. So let me just put that on the table. I know, I know, he's going to come out with a with a pile of numbers. On this, if you guys agreed on everything, it wouldn't be that fun of a discussion. But, sorry, we're not that much in disagreement. <laughs> But um, I would say, from my perspective, definitely not, that we do not provide uh, any kind of a reasonable social safety net for the poor. And, you know, my background is both in terms of research and in terms of talking to, you know, really hundreds of folks in poverty that are using these programs. I've had a lot of experience with that. And I would say these programs do not provide very much assistance if you talk to people and, and what, they're, what, what they're kind of going through. Basically, what we do in the United States is we, have, we, we basically punish the poor. We make it difficult to get these programs. There's a huge amount of stigma. And if you talk to anybody who's using a safety net program, they'll tell you about this. So we make it really difficult to access the safety net in the United States. Um, Ed had mentioned the OECD, some of that data. You know, that data shows that um, if you... Um, if you look at the high economy countries, you know, countries in Europe, Australia, and so on, um, they do much more in terms of the effectiveness of their safety net in terms of reducing poverty. We're able to reduce, the, the, really the only group that we can really reduce poverty through social programs is the elderly. And I'll talk about that a little bit down the road. Um, and, you know, just to finish up the, these comments, um, we're also very much of an outlier if we think about the safety net in terms of universal health care, of affordable child care, of affordable housing. We do very little compared to many other countries. So not only do we provide very little in terms of cash assistance, but we provide very little in terms of these other programs. So, so now it's Ed's turn. 
I'd say <laughs> arguably there's never enough, okay? But we have a much wider dispersion of potential earnings among Americans relative to Northwest Europe. Uh, and that makes it harder for us to craft a safety net in America that doesn't discourage work among our much larger share of low-skilled workers. And so a low-skilled worker working full-time in America can earn about $35,000 a year. How much of a safety net can we give them without discouraging work? Scandinavia, you know, the darling of liberal comparisons, has half as many academic low test scores as America. So they can craft a safety net for their middle and their working class that has much less impact on disincentivizing work. And Americans earn about 50% more than Europeans with comparable test scores, about 50% more. So again, a safety net that's appropriate for our middle class can create a large disincentive for a low wage worker in the United States. You know, people may mistakenly think that Europe can provide a much larger, provides a much larger safety net than they appear to provide because like Mark in your book, they don't take into account the taxes that Europe charges the poor for the services they provide. A 20% sales tax, for example, and a much higher payroll tax. So if you look after tax, if all you're doing is buying your health care from the government instead of from a private provider, you need to look at what's been transferred after tax to see the real transfers. We distribute a three times greater share of GDP to our bottom 50% as a percent of GDP. Okay. Our GDP per capita is a third larger than Northwest Europe. So dollar-wise, we're distributing four times as much money per capita as the countries that we're looking at when you don't look at the taxes that they're charging. That four times is spread over twice as many low scores. And net of taxes, you know, we are distributing substantially more to our middle and working class than Europe. About 4% of GDP versus zero in Europe. They're basically buying the benefits that they're getting. And then people look at the benefits and not the taxes. And they say, look at the wonderful safety net and social programs they have. Sure. And then they charge you 20% sales tax to get it. So our system has yielded the work, the lowest workforce participation you know, in Europe among prime working age men. So no, I don't think we need to spend more. I think we need to spend it differently. Less in the middle class, more on helping our low scoring workers remain attached to the workforce because everybody who detaches from the workforce creates generations of poverty in their wake. And that's where we should be spending a lot more of the money, but it's difficult because we don't have the talented supervision that Europe has to be able to free up the resources to do it as easily as they've been able to do it. Yeah, and I would say, you know, I'm all for spending money effectively, and I think we can think about, you know, fine-tuning some of these things. But again, I, I guess I would go back to, you know, I've, I've ex you know, talked and experienced the lives of, you know, hundreds of folks that are struggling. And I can tell you firsthand that, you know, the programs that they're getting are very, very meager, and it's really difficult to survive on those programs. What, one thing I'd point out about health care. We spend about 9% of GDP on healthcare and we give that to the poorest third of Americans. Europe spends 11% on healthcare for everybody. It's hard to believe that our prices are so different that, oh, by the way, you know, our 9% is really 12% because it's by a percent of GDP and our GDP per capita is a third larger than theirs. So if you look at our healthcare spending divided by their GDP, it's 12%. 12% for one third of the people, there's 11% for all the people. Who do you think's getting better health care? Yeah, we have higher prices. You think they're that much higher? A lot of what we call higher prices is actually higher usage. You, you know, we have much a better cancer survival rates. You can look at almost anything and compare. Not, we don't have high life expectancies because we drink a lot of alcohol. We drink a lot of unhealthy food. You know, Mexican immigrants, for example, come across the border. Their life expectancy drops significantly when they come across the border, not because our health care isn't good, but because we have unhealthy, unhealthy lifestyles. So we're spending a lot more money on health care than people think. And then we say, oh, we're not going to count the taxes that Europe is charging their, their, their people for health care, as if they're getting the 11 percent for free, whereas our 9 percent is largely getting it without paying taxes. And I would say I certainly agree that we're spending we're spending as we talked before this this event um, you know something like seven or eight thousand dollars per capita on health care but um, we're not getting the best bang for our buck we're we're losing a lot of that money and so we are we are one of a, a handful of countries in the world that do not provide universal health care. We're very much an outlier on that. And I think that, that that really costs us in many ways. And, and actually, that kind of leads into this question that I think you're going to ask, Matt, about um, economic growth. So 
That is. I'd, I'd throw one more thing just on healthcare. I just remind everybody this: we spend about 1.5 trillion dollars a year on healthcare for the bottom third. You know how much that's counted in poverty statistics? Not a dollar. Okay, they just ignore the 1.5 trillion in healthcare. In fact, what they do when they calculate poverty statistics is we offer you health care and we say, but we have to have you have a copay because otherwise you're just going to waste it. They say, oh, well, the, you, you, you spent the copay. We're going to subtract that from your income. But the health care that you got for free, that's not income. Not included. $1.5 trillion. If you look at all of the poverty statistics, you're going to find out that almost all of the statistics you hear, the $40 million, is before we give people $1.5 trillion a year. What's relevant in America is how much poverty we have after we give people 1.5 trillion. And I think what you're going to find is if you can't work, we are providing with stigma. Yes, but we are providing a lot of benefits. Why do we need stigma? Because we've got a lot of people who walk in and you look at our disability roles. They've skyrocketed because people say, oh, if you're giving away free money, I'll go to the doctor and I'll get disability and get on the roll. So do we need some stigma attached to getting the money? Yes. We need stigma attached, particularly in the United States, where we have a lot of low-wage workers who are not going to be motivated to work. They're going to be working at McDonald's the rest of their life. If you're going to wake up every morning and go, Grad, I'm going to McDonald's today to get my $12 an hour. You're not going to, you're not, somebody offers you $25,000, $30,000 of benefits to do that. You're going to have a hard time staying attached. A lot of them have a hard time staying attached to the workforce regardless. Mark, and so we, we have a complicated issue on this. Mark, I'll give you a last word before I go to question four, if you want one. Otherwise, I can go to question four. Um, no, I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> so question four, um, and we, this one, I'll read slowly as Ed gets a drink because he's the one starting us on this yeah. question. Um, how important is economic growth for a society and how should that factor into thinking about policies to help the poor? So, you know, spending uh, more than the $1.3 trillion we're spending on the poor is not our only priority. And I would say it's hardly our highest priority. So it's not an issue about whether we should help, but whether we should spend more, especially spending more on those people who remain in poverty because we've chosen not to give them more aid for good reason. So the vast majority of Americans, we should remember, are not poor. Uh, even those who can't work, by and large, are poor. It's the people who can work that we're denying aid to. And the rest of the world is vastly larger and poorer than America's poor. Who we often forget have American health care, have government guaranteed pensions, have computers, smartphones, widescreen TVs, cars, and air conditioning. Arguably, China, global warming, biological warfare, artificial intelligence, these things threaten our survival. And at the same time, we have retiring baby boomers and ballooning debts that you know, funded consumption and not investment that are going to eat our children and our private sector alive. And you can see from the Ukraine that the world would be a dark place without America to defend it. And it's growing darker as China grows stronger while the West population shrinks. So any shot we have at solving global warming, for example, is surely gonna come from America. Our innovators produce five times as many billion dollar startups as Europe. Aside from its cell phone company, France hasn't created a Fortune 500 company since 1970. Apple's worth more than the 30 largest German companies combined. That doesn't bode well for the future of Europe. Europe is shirking its responsibility by underinvesting so that it can consume more in the short run. Now, without continual investment, competition with the rest of the world is going to drag our wages down to the world wage. And the success of American innovation and entrepreneurial risk taking has made the American middle class you know, a third more prosperous than Western Europe, 50% more pros prosperous if you adjust for test scores. And our outsized contribution to innovation, defense spending, and healthcare has made the rest of the world a lot richer than it would be without us. Our trade with the rest of the world has lifted billions of people out of poverty. So, you know, we've created a home for 45 million foreign born adults and their 40 million uh, native born children. No high wage economy has done more to help the poor than our economy. And those contributions have come at the expense of not devoting more management attention and financial resources to our less skilled native born workers and to America's poor. I'd say, why would we put all that at risk? Oh, so I would say, um, I, I mean, I think this is a, uh, a place of agreement here. Um, I think economic growth is essential for um, addressing poverty. Uh, I think it's critically important. It's an, important in terms of thinking about expanding the pie. Um, but what we need to make sure is that 
everyone benefits from the growth. You know, it's sort of like the, the old phrase that a rising tide should lift all boats. And, you know, what I would argue is that what we've seen over the last 40 or 50 years in terms of inequality is that the rising tide has lifted the yachts, but has left the rowboats behind. Um, and, and we haven't really talked about what's happened in terms of inequality in the United States, but it's gotten much more skewed over these last decades. Um, and the, the analogy that I use in the book is the musical chairs analogy, and just to, to, to make it very short, it's the idea that, you know, we can have a game of musical chairs, we can either focus on who loses out at the game, or the fact that there's going that the game is going to produce losers because there aren't enough chairs for the people playing. And I would argue that economic growth is one way of increasing the number of chairs in the game. Um, I think the other thing that, that um, I've seen research on, and actually I have a colleague that, uh, at Washington University that's done research on this, that the growing inequality that we've seen in the United States has actually stunted our economic growth. It's actually served as a drag on economic growth because that growth is not going to the middle class as it used to go. So, um, so I think that that's, that that's another aspect of this. But, but in general, I think you know, economic growth is really fundamental to helping to address poverty and helping to change kind of the structure of the game rather than just focusing on who loses out at the game. A couple quick thoughts. What you really care about is consumption and quality. You want a poor person to have to be able to spend money. They're not going to be able to save money. So often it's focused on wealth inequality. What am I going to get 50 years from now from some legal contract that I have? What really matters, there's no time travel. We're not bringing anything back from the future. So what matters is today who's consuming what. If you look at consumption inequality, it's barely changed in the 1960s. You got guys like Bill Gates. They have a ton of money. They don't spend a fraction of what they're getting. Now, we say, frequently people say, well, that's causing slower growth. Well, is it really? Because we know we have less, in, we have more inequality in the United States. Our productivity is growing 60% faster per hour work than Western Europe is. You look at Americans, we were 18% richer than Germans uh, in 2000. We're 30% richer than Germans today. So whatever we're doing, which is creating companies, investing money, investing in R&D, producing startups, driving our middle class wages up higher, you know, it's hard to say, oh, that's because the inequality is slowing growth in the United States. I don't believe it's true. And I tell you what, I don't buy the argument that jobs are musical chairs. As I said before, 45 million foreign born adults and their 20 million native born adult children have moved here, found homes and found employment. We have grown work 50% faster than Europe has during this period. So we are here creating a ton of jobs. Now, if we bring somebody from Mexico who is scoring very low on a, on a test because they don't have a high school education, we cannot create a high paying job for that person. We have to create a job that that person is able to do. And that's a job that a customer will pay them to do. It's difficult to do. I'll tell you this though, if you go into New York, you won't find a person in construction who, speak, who doesn't speak Spanish. So somewhere these guys are getting pretty high paying jobs. That's what I see where I am all throughout. throughout. The, so I just, this, this notion that it's musical chairs and if you wanted a job, you can't get one because there just isn't enough of them. It just flies in the face of the data. Well, I would, I would respectfully disagree with that. I, just, I don't think it at all flies in the face of the data. And I think we have data and actually, I, Matt and I were working on this. I created this labor market simulator, which actually uses data from the Census Bureau and from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and shows the imbalance between the number of people who are in the labor market looking for a decent paying job and the number of decent paying jobs. And there's a clear mismatch between those two. So I would respectfully disagree with you on that. And only one thing I'd say is you gotta be very careful about using census data because it's based on a census survey and it's been proven that there's gross underreporting on income, benefits received. Nobody uses the census surveys anymore. They have to have significant adjustments to make them work. And they get worse and worse over time because we all know that when somebody tries to survey you, you hang up your phone today. There's nobody coming to your door. I mean, they try to come to your door and talk to you, but it's difficult. So the census data gets gets. Uh, gets worse and worse. Over. Well, this is the current population survey that's done out of the census, yeah. out of the census, but also with the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And, you know, this is the data in which each month we get what the unemployment statistics are and so on and so that's forth. Better data. Yeah. That, the second is much better data, yes. Well, question number five. Yes. Um, Mark, we're starting with you on this one. 
So um, both of our authors here, you've both written books on addressing poverty and inequality, but as we're seeing here, right, you clearly have different views on the issue, and this is not uncommon. I'm sure many in the room have different views. Many in Congress certainly have different views on what to do to address issues regarding poverty and inequality. Can you think of a policy that would not only help reduce poverty, but you think would garner bipartisan support? Yeah, so I was thinking about this question, like what would Ed and I agree on or what, what, what would my, uh, somebody who's more progressive versus somebody who's more conservative agree on? And um, the policy that I came up with was the uh, earned income tax credit. Uh, for those of you that don't know, if you're, if you're working during the year and you're below a certain level, when you file your taxes, you can get a, a, a refund in terms of, um, uh, you know, again, being below a certain income level. And it turns out that that's actually the largest anti-poverty cash program in the United States. A lot of people aren't aware of that. But, you know, if you were making ten dollars or $15,000, you might get three or $4,000 back in terms of, a, of the earned income tax credit. And that has a, is a pretty strong effect in terms of pulling families and households above the poverty line. It has a, actually a pretty good anti-poverty effect. And it is a policy that both conservatives and liberals uh, tend to support. Conservatives like the policy because it's reinforcing the work incentives. You can only get the credit if you're working. Um, liberals like the policy because it's providing support to poor families or low-income families, and, and they're certainly in favor of that. So I think the, you know, the one that came to my mind was the earned income tax credit is something that has support on both sides of the aisle, I would say. I do agree with that, by the way. Um, I'd say if we can't increase, if we can't all agree to increase high-skilled immigration, if that can't garner uh, bipartisan support, then I don't know what can, because that's just free money, and we're just uh, letting it slide away. Uh, and we're doing it at a time when it's critical, I think, in the future for America to be strong, not to be weak, and we just grab everybody we can. Um, I believe that fair-minded liberals and conservatives want the same thing. They want to maximize middle and working class incomes, and they want to help the poor. We just differ drastically about how to do it. And I think both of us, we stand next to each other, largely in agreeing, agreement, uh, but we're pointing in opposite directions about which way we think optimal lies. And so I see little chance for constructive agreement. And I think even liberal economists agree that producers, investors, innovators have to create about five dollars of value for customers and employees to put a dollar of profit in their pocket. A computer, for example, is worth substantially more than it costs. Economists, they call this buyer surplus. You won't find it counted in GDP, which measures everything at uh, cost. And so producers compete with each other to give you a greater, uh, to get a greater share of your spending by delivering a greater share of value relative to the cost of the price. It's five to one today, it's six to one tomorrow. And this competition between producers is what raises living standards gradually over time. And so conservatives believe that incentivizing investors and innovators to take the risk that's necessary to create another five dollars is far more valuable than redistributing a greater fraction of the dollar that they keep. And so I think liberals derisively call this trickle down, but it's really trickle up because we enjoy five dollars of value when they put another dollar of, of profits into their park pocket. And so we see higher payoffs for risk taking that produce, you know, where we see them, higher payoffs for risk taking. Uh, we see greater risk taking in Europe versus America. We see greater risk taking. We see faster growth. We see higher middle and work, working class incomes. But despite the evidence, I see little chance for agreement on this, on this critical issue. So I, what I see is this. Instead, both sides agree on all the wrong things. So one of the things, buying votes by cutting middle class taxes below the cost of the government services they consume, which removes any governor on government spending. Second thing I see is borrowing money from offshore investors and using it to buy votes by increasing in some consumption instead of increasing investment, which hurts our children. And I see us buying votes by increasing government spending as a share of GDP, which cannibalizes our private sector, the only thing that grows prosperity. And all of this to me represents the worst of democracy. And these are the things I see us agreeing on. Um, I'd, like, I'd like your opinion on two, because uh, it seemed there to be agreement on the earned income tax mm -hmm. credit. Be curious if you agree with Ed on the idea of increasing high skilled immigration, and also if you agree with the problems on what we, you know, Ed's talked about the problems that 
the things that are problematic that we agreed on. I'd be curious if your take on, on that. On yeah, um, you know, in terms of um, immigration, I mean, there is an argument out there that, uh, you know, that immigrants are coming in and, uh, and taking jobs. Um, others argue that actually immigrants, you know, provide a vitality to our economy. So, you know, this is, that's an area that I'm really not, uh, I really don't have expertise in. So I don't want to, I don't want to step out of, uh, out of line. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, what I would say is this, I think what you find is if you're a low skilled worker and we buy uh, things from foreign countries, it's, it's probably, you know, we're buying them because it's more valuable to buy them from a foreign country than it is to make it here. So we are benefiting on net. The problem is the low skill workers paying 100% of the cost and we're enjoying a big share of the benefits. So who's paying the cost relative to the benefits that they're getting? And I think what you'll find in many other places like that, you know, right now we have a shortage of workers. And part of the reason we have a shortage of workers is because President Trump put the clamps on immigration during his tenure, if you actually look at the numbers, and right now we're seeing about 2 million shortage of low-skilled workers, and it's driving up low-skilled wages, which are growing faster than, than, uh, um, than wages are on average at the moment. Um, so I just think, um, yes, America benefits from having cheap labor. I don't think the guys with low scores are benefiting from the supply of labor. Remember, we're getting a ton of labor from immigration, we're getting a ton of labor from automation, and we're getting a ton of labor from offshoring production. All of that hits our low skill workers, and all of that benefits our high skill workers. So yeah, we're all better off. It's the people in this room that are getting most of the benefits from that. And it's the people who aren't in this room who are paying most of the cost. And I'm all for some of these things. Look, you gotta trade. It's like having computers and saying, we're not gonna use computers because they lower wages. Yeah, that's going to make you real competitive in the long run. It doesn't work. You have to trade. But you have to recognize that it has real costs to people. We'll move on to question six. I'll start with Ed on this one. Uh, this question's from Larry Chaponis. Is it inevitable that a certain percentage of people in a society will be poor? And relatedly, how much poverty is, quote unquote, too much poverty? Well, I'd say it sure seems inevitable when you look at the world. Uh, there's large differences in the capabilities of people and in the value of paying people to help other people. So I think we're always going to have inequality. We don't find places where incomes are distributed more equally and people are more prosperous. So despite having far less talent, we're substantially more prosperous and growing faster than Europe. And Europe would be poor still if it wasn't free riding on our leadership. Um, worse, I think, is taking away private property through heavy taxation which does threaten and endanger freedom more broadly, and I think has echoing effects on, on society. And I think that, you know, the philosopher Rawls, he offers us a false choice, which is less income for all, including the poor. And so, you know, to my perspective, it's immoral to demand equality at the expense of everyone else, or to demand equal distribution throughout the world, for example, uh, at the expense of American innovation and our ability to uh, defend freedom. And so the left claims that we can lower the payoffs for risk-taking without slowing the, the risk-taking and growth, despite the success of America relative to Europe. You know, they claim that inequality stems from crony cronyism and monopoly rents, despite seeing America's most profitable companies investing more, funding more R&D, paying higher wages, and growing faster than their competitors. That's the opposite of oligopolistic behavior. And seeing the, the turnover of the Fortune 500 companies, the Forbes 400, and American CEO tenures accelerating, which is the opposite of cronyism. I think they claim that risk takers are just lucky. And imagine you're agreeing to take risk uh, by you know, walking across a tightrope, bringing back riches on the other side of the gully for your cut of the profits. And when you get back to your side, they say, hey, you were just lucky. Luck is the flip side of risk. So, you know, it's, it's not a question of, of, of success bubbling, success bubbles up randomly from a large pool of failure, and we have to pay the successful people to motivate the failure. So in the wake of the success of the Bill Gates and the Steve Jobs of the world, an army of talented risk takers flocked to Silicon Valley. We didn't see it happen in Europe. We didn't see it happen in Japan. And so I believe this, as long as we logically pay for successful risk taking that's being taken in the best interest of everybody, there's always going to be inequality. And we're lucky we're going to get inequality because it means people are succeeding in the risk that they take something that's not happening in other high-wage economies anywhere near 
to the extent that it's happening here. So should we help the people who uh, can't work? Absolutely. But for the sake of our children, I think we have to insist that people who can work do work. And that is a complicated calculation that we can't just ignore. So the question was really focused on poverty, not inequality. And I would say poverty is definitely not inevitable. Um, this is the, the book that, uh, that um, Matt referred to, um, deals with a number of myths that are out there. And this is one of the myths that we talk about in one of the chapters. And the myth is, it really goes back thousands of years, the poor you will have with you always uh, from, the, from the Bible. Um, and that is not, you know, that is not true. And we can, we can look at this in a couple different ways. One, we can look at how other countries are doing. There's, wide there's a wide variance in terms of poverty rates across a number of countries. Most countries in Europe have a much, much lower rate of poverty than we do. And the main reason they do is they do much more to address the issues of poverty. Um, we've talked about the safety net and other things as well. Another way of thinking about this is in the 1960s, in the United States, the poverty rate in 1959 was 22%. By 1973, it was 11%. We had a war on poverty. We had a strong economy. We cut poverty by half during that period of time. So this is not just written in stone. This can change um, quite a bit over a short period of time. And in terms of the question of how much you know, is too much poverty, um, I would say, first of all, we definitely in the United States have too much poverty. I think we could do a lot to cut that rate at least in half and maybe more. Um, and I'll just end with one, one example of where we really have had a success story. In 1959, the poverty rate for the elderly in the United States was around 35%. Today, it's 9%. And there's only one reason for that, Social Security and Medicare, along with the SSI program. Those programs have been remarkably effective in reducing poverty among the elderly. So if we didn't have those programs today, poverty rate for the elderly would go from 9% to about 40%. So that shows you that poverty is not inevitable, that we can do a lot to address the issue. And there's many ways to think about how that's being done. I, I would just, a couple thoughts. You, elderly can't work, okay? or we don't want them to work. You know, you're 80 years old, it's going to be tough for you to work. So yes, for people who can't work, giving people money who can't work is going to help them get out of poverty. There's no question about it. And the same is true for single mothers with young children. It's for disabled workers. And I think what you would just, just really realize is that for people who can't work, we have done a very good job of taking care of them. It's when we get to the more complicated people alcoholics, for example, where we would say if you're, a drug, if you're addicted to drugs, it's going to be very difficult for you to work. But at the same time, are we going to really facilitate your drug addiction? It's going to get more complicated. And so it, that's the piece of poverty that's left. I think if you go back into the past, there are many ways to go back into the past. There's lots of different studies. But you know, if you look at the poverty level, when the, uh, President Johnson created the war on poverty, there are people who have looked at that level and say we've gone from 20% to about two and a half percent. There are other people who look, you know, because really what's happening is there's inflation, which is causing our poverty levels to rise. There's supplemental measures, which are, are relative to the uh, to income. So they're changing as, as the incomes are rising. So if you hold the poverty level constant, you'd see a very big reduction in poverty, largely because we've been able to go in and help everybody who can't work. We are helping them. And the place where we run into trouble is for the people who can work. And it's difficult. You're going to have people who have low test scores, alcoholic addiction problems, maybe have uh, some uh, mental health problems where they could work, but it's difficult for them to work. And that's where I say you need a lot of supervision if you're going to help those people remain attached to the workforce. And what we have seen is a large increase in those number of people. It used to be that working guys 25 to 55 the workforce participation rate was in the high 90s. Okay, we're in the mid the 80s now. And if you stratify that by education, we're at 80% for high school graduates. And if you do it by age, the younger generation is five points behind the older generation. So we're trending in the wrong direction. We're going to end up with poverty there unless we decide that we're going to pay those people too. And that's largely who you're going to see is left in poverty after we get done spending two trillion dollars on the elderly and one and a half trillion dollars on the non-elderly.
Any response or? Uh, you know, I mean, I, again, the question is, you know, is poverty inevitable? And I would go back to what I was saying that, no, it is not inevitable. There are many things we can do to reduce poverty. Um, so, yeah, I would just reiterate that point. Cool. Um, I want to thank you both before I get to the closing statements for, for your time here tonight um, to kind of help. And it's wonderful to see such a crowd here. Uh, I think it's been a wonderful discussion. Appreciated the agreements and the disagreements. I'll say that earlier today, I think I uh, had both agreements and disagreements separately with each of you on various policies as we were just chit chatting. I want to give you uh, three to four minutes for closing statements and, uh, and then and we'll end tonight's event. So we will start. So I'm on. You get All right. Start? Yeah. All right. So let, let me let me make this good. Um, so you know, I was thinking about you know what do I want to end uh, leave you with in terms of of my comments, and um, you know, I guess my my perspective would be that uh, reducing poverty um, and inequality is really in all of our best interests. Um, there was a study that I did uh, about three or four years ago. And what we tried to do was measure what's the economic cost of childhood poverty in the United States? Because we know that childhood poverty is associated with higher healthcare costs. It's associated with less worker productivity. It's associated with greater incarceration costs. So we've tried to be conservative and look at several things that we know are related to childhood poverty. And the estimate that we came up with was that childhood poverty was costing the United States on a conservative level about $1.1 trillion a year. That's a huge amount. In 2015, that was about 28% of the entire federal budget. So we are paying for that. And what we're doing is we're paying for poverty on the back end of the problem rather than the front end of the problem. And it's always more expensive to pay for something on the back end. Prevention is always a better way to, to go. Um, the other thing that we showed in this study was that for every dollar we spend on reducing childhood poverty, we would save between seven and $12 down the road. So the argument that we make is that um, not only is poverty, the, the reducing poverty, the right thing to do, but it's also the economically smart thing to do as well. We are wasting our human potential by not reducing poverty in this country. Um, uh, finally, you know, I guess the, the, the other thing that I would leave you with is, you know, it's often said that a society will be judged by what they do for the least among us. And as I have sort of made my arguments um, during this last hour, I would say that that judgment will be quite harsh, that we are doing very, very little for the least among us. And again, I would go back to the, what I was talking about when I've talked to lots of people in poverty, lots of people, low-income folks. These are people that are struggling. They're struggling on a day-to-day -day basis. And you probably have encountered folks like this as well. In fact, you or maybe your family has experienced that. You know, one of, one of the aspects of my work that I look at is how widespread is poverty across an individual's lifetime? And what we've, we've looked at this in a number of different ways, but depending on how you define poverty, between 60 and 75% of Americans at some point in their lives will experience a year in poverty. So this is very widespread. And the reason why it's widespread is because if you think over a long period of time, things happen to people. You lose a job, you get sick, a pandemic occurs. And when those things happen, there's not a lot in place to protect people. So, um, you know, I, I guess I would just end by saying that and, and arguing that uh, we really can and must do better by being judged by the standard of what are we doing for the least among us. I would just comment on that. I'd say, you know, we're spending 1.3 trillion on, on helping on the non-elderly. Let's say half of that lands in the pocket of the poor. It's probably slightly higher, but at 650 million times seven would be 4.5 trillion dollars. You'd think at the margin we'd be doing even, you know, the first dollar is going to do a lot more than the last hour. So he's claiming seven times at the margin. Do we really believe that the 20 trillion dollars of GDP that we have, five trillion of that we wouldn't have if we weren't spending the money that we're spending on poverty? We're spending a ton of money on poverty. I don't think we're seeing anything like seven times the value coming from it. But just to close, I'd say this. You've got to keep in mind that America has very different demographic than other high-wage economies. And given our demographics, we don't have the luxury of wasting our talent. 
America's talent needs to remain twice as productive as other high wage economies if we don't want our middle and working class wages dragged down to the world wage. And with video conferencing, allowing companies to easily utilize the rest of the world's talent, that's not going to be easy going forward. We take America's success for granted and its abundance for granted, but we created our success at a time when America was largely uncontested in the world and when energy was very cheap. The future looks a lot tougher than the past. And so retiring baby boomers and sky-high debts are poised to eat us alive. China's tyranny threatens our dominance scientifically, economically, militarily, and politically, and the rest of the high world, wage world has failed to contribute proportionally to, on any of these fronts. Lesser still if they weren't free riding on America's leadership. Low birth rates are shrinking our population of all the high wage democracies of the world while the rest of the developing world and the autocracies of the world continue to grow exponentially. You see global warming, biological weapons, artificial intelligence are all growing threats that remain unsolved. And macro and microeconomics explain why America has succeeded. While Europe and Japan have failed to contribute proportionally, higher payoffs for successful risk taking, which is the foundation of producing innovation, has spurred increased investment in risk taking in the United States relative to those countries. Our higher payoffs don't stem from lower taxes per se, although taxes bear directly on the returns. They stem from successful risk taking, having gradually built institutions like Google and Silicon Valley that train our most talented workers and increase the payoffs for successful risk taking. Because of America's success, middle and working class Americans earn substantially more than comparable scoring Europeans and Japanese. And net of taxes, which Mark's books ignores and many other people ignore, we distribute about four times more money to the bottom 50% than Western Europe does. Uh, we can lower the payoffs for success with higher taxes and a growing share of government spending while hardly noticing it in the short run, but the effects will be gradually, exponentially compounding and permanent in the long run. So we can always mortgage our future to increase consumption today, but given what looms before us, I don't know why we would take that risk. Success produces about $5 of values for others for every dollar of wealth that it creates. And studies show us that the prosperity of the poor is directly proportional to the prosperity of the economy that they're a part of. And that society's generosity, its civility, and its willingness to sacrifice are proportional to the rate of growth. And so to the hammer, a world is a nail. You know, advocates of the poor will demand more, no matter how much more we give them. You know, we spend $2 trillion on the elderly. We spend $1 trillion on the non-elderly, not counting the $4 trillion we spent during the pandemic. It's 15% of GDP, most of which, shockingly, is not counted in the poverty statistics, which doesn't even count the $1.5 trillion we spend on health care. That's enough spending to lift everybody out of poverty if we spend it wisely and if we spent less of it buying middle-class votes. If middle-class Americans won't pay for the government services they consume, we're in deep trouble in the long run, and we're spending too much money if they won't pay. Government spending has grown from 32% of GDP to 38% today if you back out the pandemic spending. It's projected to grow to nearly 50% as the baby boomers retire and the debt compounds in the interest rate. And so the private sector alone produces all of the prosperity we enjoy. I'd say quit ignoring the fact that cannibalizing the private sector to do other things has enormous costs. Help the poor. Of course we should help the poor. Spend more helping the poor. Perhaps we should do that too. But increase government spending as a share of GDP to do it? No. Reallocate the spending among the priorities. Don't conflate the two. We're spending a lot more money than people realize. And what I'd say to the students here, your moral responsibility as talented people is to get the arduous training, perform the tedious tasks, and take the risks that create innovation and value and high paying jobs for other people. It's hard to create value. It's easy to give away hard earned value created by other people. Don't be misled about what the world needs from you. We need you to go to work and help other people. Uh, I hope everybody will join me in a round of applause to say thank you very much. For